É um enorme prazer uh, ter no Brasil uh, o nosso ídolo, uh, o que, quem a gente considera sucessor da linha missesiana, uh, o, o professor Hans Hoppe. O professor Hans Hoppe, uh, ele, para quem não conhece, eu duvido que tenha alguém aqui que não o conheça, uh, mas ele avançou, entre outras contribuições, ele avançou muito a teoria do direito natural, Uh, através da teoria da ética argumentativa que ele desenvolveu, baseada em Habermas, que foi professor uh, dele. E, então, é uma enorme honra uh, apresentar o professor Hans, uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, que é membro sênior do Ludwig von Mises Institute, fundador e presidente da Property and Freedom Society, editor do Journal of Libertarian Studies e coeditor do periódico Review, of Austrian Economics. Recebeu o PhD e fez seu pós-doutorado na Goethe University em Frankfurt, Alemanha. E é o autor, entre, outro entre outros trabalhos, de uma teoria sobre socialismo e capitalismo, Democracy, the God that Failed, and the Economics and Ethics of Private Property. Professor Hoppe. First, I want to thank uh, Helio for this invitation, and uh, I want to thank all of you uh, for attending this conference and bearing with me for a little bit to hear hopefully something exciting and at least for some of you rather new. Um, let me begin by briefly talking about what I refer to as the problem of social order. Uh, imagine Robinson Crusoe alone on his island. Um, Robinson Crusoe can do on his island whatever he wants. The problem of social cooperation, um, the problem of orderly human conduct simply does not arise, arise, uh, arise for him. Um, in order for this problem to arise, there needs to be a second person appearing on the scene. Uh, so Friday appears on the scene. Um, now imagine that this island is like the Garden of Eden. There exists a superabundance of goods. Um, everything is available for free, just as the air that we breathe is typically available for free. Um, as long as this is the case, Obviously, no conflicts can arise between Robinson Crusoe and Friday, because whatever one person does, he never takes anything away from anyone else. Uh, the current supply of goods for him uh, is as high as it was initially, and there are as many goods left over for Friday uh, as they were before. Um, a conflict between Robinson Crusoe and Friday can only arise insofar as goods are scarce, um, insofar as goods do not exist in superabundance. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, there exist only two things that are scarce and only two types of conflicts can arise. Um, What is scarce, even in the Garden of Eden, where there is a superabundance of everything else, what is scarce in the Garden of Eden is, on the one hand, my own physical body, I have only one of it, uh, and the standing room where my body rests. Uh, if Robinson Crusoe wants to do something with Friday's body, or Friday wants to do something with Robinson Crusoe's body, If Robinson Crusoe wants to stand exactly at the place where Friday stands, then a conflict arises because there is a scarcity of, uh, of goods. And we would need in the Garden of Eden then also rules of peaceful human cooperation, of orderly human cooperation in order to avoid these types of conflicts that I just characterized. And in the real world, which is characterized, of course, 
while all around scarcity, where everything is scarce, we would need rules that make it possible that conflicts can be avoided with respect to all sorts of scarce goods. Now, in the history of social and political thought, all sorts of, and, and this problem, how we arrange peaceful relations vis-a-vis -vis scarce goods is what I call the problem of social order. In the history of social thought, all sorts of proposals have been made how we solve this problem of social order. And because a multitude of uh, proposals has been made, many people have thought there is no unique, no one correct solution to the problem of social order. But I want to argue that, yes, there exists one correct problem to the, social, to the problem of social order. There exists one exact correct answer to, to the question, how can we avoid interpersonal conflicts given that there are scarcity of goods? Let me just outline briefly what the correct solution is. Uh, it is a solution that has been known for a long period of time. It has been somewhat refined in the course uh, of the centuries, but the solution is rather, rather simple, as you will recognize very quickly. Let me formulate first the solution for the Garden of, for the Garden of Eden, uh, for paradise. There we only need one rule, and that rule is um, everybody can do whatever he wants, can move around wherever he wants, occupy any place he wants, as long as no other body is standing at the same, at the same place. Um, that is, or to formulate it differently, we may place or move our own bodies wherever we want, provided only that no one else is already occupying or standing at a certain place. And outside of the Garden of Eden, uh, that is in the real world of all around scarcity, um, there are four interrelated rules that people need to follow in order to avoid all sorts of conflicts. The first one is every person is the exclusive owner of its own physical body. I can do with my body whatever I want. Nobody is permitted to interfere with it. Uh, if I want to do something to somebody else, then I need this other person's permission to do this. Um, that's the first rule. Um, we can immediately see that there are intuitively no other alternatives. Who else should be the owner of my physical body except me? Who else should own Robinson Crusoe except Robinson Crusoe? Should Friday own him? Uh, or should Friday and Robinson Crusoe own each bothers jointly? But then immediately you see that this does not avoid conflicts, that causes conflicts. It makes conflicts, so to speak, permanent. Um, the second rule is every person is the private or exclusive owner uh, of all nature-given resources or goods that he has perceived as scarce and appropriated for the very first time. You can also formulate this rule, he who uses something that was previously unowned for the very first time becomes the owner of this thing. Again, the alternatives would be, uh, who else should own it? Somebody who was not the first one who, do, who does something to something else? Uh, the second one? Or the second and the first one together? Um, and immediately we recognize again that this, the alternative rules would not avoid conflicts, but they would make permanent uh, a conflict, in fact, permanent. Um, and the third and fourth rule follow basically from the first and from the first and second. That is, every person who, with the help of his body and those things that he appropriated for the first time, produces something new, becomes the owner of what he has produced. As long as he does not 
physically damage the property of others in the course of producing what he has produced. And the fourth rule is, uh, once a good has been first appropriated or has been produced, ownership in such a good can only be acquired by a voluntary transfer from a previous owner to a later owner. Those are all the rules. If we would follow these rules, then all conflicts could be avoided uh, and we would have eternal peace, so to speak. Uh, cooperation would always go on in a completely smooth way. Um, I can spare myself the task of giving some detailed justification of these rules. I have done that in, uh, in various writings of myself, but I trust that you intuitively sense that we in our daily lives by and large recognize these rules and act according to these rules anyhow. Um, now, let me emphasize, however, this. Contrary to the frequently heard claim uh, that the institution of private property, as I described it, private property in bodies, private property in previously unowned things, and so forth, uh, in contrast to the frequently heard claim that um, private property is just a convention, I want to emphasize that this is definitely not the case. A convention serves a purpose, and a convention is characterized by the fact that there exists an alternative to it. For instance, the, the Latin alphabet, which we use, uh, serves the purpose of written communication. Um, and there exists an alternative to it. We have, for instance, a Cyrillic alphabet that we can use instead of using the Latin alphabet. Uh, what, however, is the purpose of norms? What is the purpose of rules? And the answer is, uh, if there were no interpersonal conflicts whatsoever, then we would not need any rules whatsoever. Uh, we only need rules, we only need social norms because there are conflicts in this world. And the purpose of norms or rules is to avoid otherwise unavoidable conflict. Um, a norm that would generate conflict that creates conflicts is contrary to the very purpose of a norm or a rule. Or we can also say a norm that creates conflicts is a perversion instead of is what a rule is supposed to do, namely to help us avoid conflicts. Um, and with regard to the purpose of conflict avoidance, then the institution of private property is definitely not just a convention uh, because no alternative to it exists. Uh, only private or exclusive property makes it possible that all otherwise unavoidable conflicts can be avoided. And only the principle of property acquisition by acts of original appropriation, that is, of appropriating something that was previously unowned, makes it possible that conflicts can be avoided from the beginning of mankind on, so to speak, until its very, uh, very end. Because the first appropriator of something did not involve anyone in any conflict. He was the first one. Nobody else was there. So the first appropriation of something as private property is a conflict-free way of transferring something that was previously some external thing into something that is private property. Now the next problem what I want to address is the problem of the enforcement of social order uh, and the protection of private property rights. Um, now, even if people recognize, so to speak, the validity of the rules that ha I have explained, and even though we might know how to avoid all conflicts, it is still possible that some people simply do not care. Um, 
that you say, oh, I know how to avoid conflicts, but I don't want to avoid conflict. I benefit, I hope to personally benefit by being involved in conflicts with, uh, with other people. Um, so what every society needs is, of course, also institutions and mechanisms um, that uh, enf enforce these rules, that deal with norm breakers, with rule breakers who simply do not behave in a civilized, in a civilized manner. Um, how do we accomplish this task? That is, how do we deal with murderers and rapists and, uh, and robbers and the normal criminal folks that we are all familiar with? Who is supposed to make sure that these people are brought to order? Uh, the standard answer that is given to this question, uh, the answer that is also given, for instance, by Ludwig von Mises to this uh, question is, this is the task of the state. That is, the enforcement of law and order is the first and primary duty of the state. Um, now, whether this answer is correct or not depends on how is the state defined. And I give you the standard definition of the state, not some crazy definition that I have come up with, but this definition that you find in almost every textbook. What is, what is a state? Uh, and the definition is the state is an agency that is characterized by two unique characteristics. First, the state is an agency that exercises a territorial monopoly of ultimate decision making. In every case of conflict, the state is the institution that decides who is right and who is wrong. And there is no appeal beyond the state. Nobody is above the state. And the implications of this will become clear as I go on. This also means the state is the ultimate arbiter in, any in every case of conflict that involves the state itself. That is, if the state or the state agents are involved in a conflict with other people, the state or agents of the state decide who is right and who is wrong in those types of conflicts also. And the second unique characteristic of the state is the state is a territorial monopolist of taxation. It can unilaterally determine what people must pay to the state for performing this function of being the ultimate judge in every case of conflict. Now, as widespread as the standard view regarding the necessity of the institution of the state as a provider of law and order is, it stands in clear contradiction to elementary economic and moral laws and principles. Let me explain this quickly. Um, among economists and philosophers, there are two propositions that, are almost that they almost universally agree to. The first one is, every monopoly is bad from the viewpoint of consumers not from the viewpoint of the producers. Every producer loves to be a monopolist. But from the viewpoint of consumers, monopolies are bad for the following reason. Um, monopoly is defined as, uh, in, in the classical meaning, uh, as a firm that has an exclusive privilege. I, firm A, am the only one who is allowed to produce a certain product. No one else is allowed to produce this product or service except, except me. Why is that bad from the point of view of consumers? It's easy to predict. It is bad from the viewpoint of consumers because shielded from potential competitors, uh, the price for this good or service will be higher than it otherwise would be and the quality of this good or service will be lower than it otherwise would be. Um, and the second statement on which almost all philosophers and economists agree 
yeah, is the production of law and order, that is, the enforcement of laws, um, that is, or the production of security, is the primary function of the state, and the state is defined, as I just uh, explained before, as a territorial monopolist of ultimate decision making. Um, now, obviously, both of these statements are incompatible. That is, they contradict each other. Monopoly is bad on the one hand, but for the production of security, we need a monopolist. We need the state. Now, most philosophers and economists don't even bother about this contradiction. They don't seem to be even aware of this contradiction. And if they are made aware of it, or if they somehow themselves recognize there is some contradiction between the two statements, then the usual way out is to say, um, then there is something wrong with the statement that all monopolies are bad, and we stick to the proposition that law and order must be provided by a monopolist. That is, they find fault not with the first proposition, uh, fault with the first proposition, but not with the second proposition. Instead, I want to just argue it is exactly the other way around. The proposition about monopolies is bad is true. The proposition about the state having to be a monopolist in order to enforce law and order is actually false. Um, as a territorial monopolist of ultimate decision making and law enforcement, the state is not just like any other monopolist um, that is such as a milk monopolist or a car monopolist who produces milk at too high prices and too low quality or cars at too high prices and too low quality. In contrast to all other monopolists, the state is not only an institution that produces inferior goods, bad goods, low quality goods, um, but it actually produces bads. That is to say, goods that are not really goods at all, what we call bads. Um, in fact, the state must first produce bads, especially in the form of taxation, which are obviously not a good. I'm not screaming, come on, do me something good and take taxes from me. It's obviously not a good. Um, so the state in order to do anything good at all, or something that looks like it might be a good, must first do something bad uh, in order to then do something good. Um, now, if an agency is the ultimate judge in every case of conflict, then it is also, as I already indicated, the judge in all cases of conflict involving the state itself. Um, a monopolist of ultimate decision making then will not just prevent conflicts and uh, arbitrate so that conflicts are resolved. Uh, if you can decide who is right and wrong in every case, even in cases involving yourself, then you will provoke and cause conflicts and then, of course, decide these conflicts in your own favor. To use a drastic example, I hit you on the head, then you complain that why did you hit me on the head? And then I say, okay, I'm the judge in this case, and I tell you that you looked at me in a very strange way, and I had the feeling that I had to hit you on the head. Um, and now you have to just pay me also on top of it, because I made this very just verdict that you deserved to be hit on the head by myself. <laughs> it should also be clear that constitutions or Supreme Courts or something like this do not change anything in this regard. Um, because Supreme Courts or um, uh, uh, constitutions need to be interpreted also. By whom are they interpreted? They are interpreted by employees of the same organization that 
caused the conflict in the first case, and it is of course predictable that they will by and large always decide in favor of the state itself. After all, they are agents of this agency themselves. Um, what we can then predict is instead of recognizing private property rights and laws that are eternally the same, states will substitute legislation for law. That is, they make the law. They make laws that say, it is all right if I hit you on the head sometimes. Um, in addition, as the ultimate judge, the state is also a monopolist of taxation. That is, it can unilaterally determine, without the consent of those that are affected by it, um, what its subjects must pay for this uh, service that the state, alleged service that the state provides. Um, in other words, the state is, by definition, an expropriating property protector. You realize this is obviously a contradiction in, uh, in terms. Uh, and then, motivated like everyone else by the idea that the more money I can spend, the better off I am. And the less I work, the less I really have to work for something, the better off I am also. It is predictable that the amount of taxes collected will continuously increase and the protection offered, the protection of life and property by the state will continuously go down. For the state, the best thing is uh, to maximize expenditure on what they call protection of life and property. And in fact, minimize the actual production uh, of, uh, pro of uh, protection of uh, life and property. Now, I want to add to this uh, that these errors involved in statism general, that is in the idea that we need a state in order to protect our lives and our property, there are additional errors involved when it comes to the idea of a democratic state in particular. The traditional pre-modern form of a state is that of an absolute monarchy. Um, but monarchies were faulted because, especially also by classical liberals, uh, because they said the monarchies rest on privileges. Uh, the king has privileges as compared with regular subjects. There is, uh, monarchies are incompatible with the idea of equality before the law of all people. Now what they proposed and the democratic opponents of monarchical states was we have to open entry into the state to everyone and that allegedly makes everyone equal before the law. Everyone can now become the king, so to speak. Um, however, this democratic equality, everyone can pos potentially become the king, um, is something entirely different from the idea of a universal law that applies to all people in the same, uh, in the same way. The objectionable dualism between a higher law of the kings and a lower law, so to speak, of regular people exists under a democratic conditions just as before. Um, the only difference is that the privileges are no longer personal privileges, privileges of the noble class or of the king, but they are functional privileges. That is, there is in democracies, a difference between what we call private law, which is the law that covers the relationship between private citizens, and public law that protects public officials and regulates what public officials can do. There exists a difference between private law and public law, and public law is, so to speak, superior over private, private law. Under democracy, if you are a functionary if you are a public official, you can do things that as a private citizen you would not be allowed to do. 
just as a king could do something that private people could not do. As a, per as a private person, I cannot take your money out of your wallet is considered to be stealing. Um, on the other hand, if I do it as a public official, then it is called taxation. Um, if as a private person I steal money from you and then do something beneficial to somebody else, I give it to a next pers the person next to me, uh, this would be called stealing and fencing of stolen goods. If you do that as a public official, then it is called social policy. Um, if I take you, kidnap you, force you to work for me, as a private citizen, this would be considered enslavement and I would be punished for it. On the other hand, if I'm a public official, I take you, enslave you, uh, serve in the army for two years or something like this, then that is called public, I, I'm compelling you to do public service. So you realize this difference between two types of laws uh, exists under democracy just as much as it existed under monarchy. But things are even worse than this. Um, because look at what takes place when we replace kings with democratic rulers. The king considered the country, so to speak, as his private property. Uh, he could sell it off, he could pass it off in the form of inheritance to the next generation and so forth. Um, under democracy, you replace somebody who considers the country his personal property with somebody who is, the pers who is a caretaker, a temporary caretaker for a certain period of time of the country. He cannot sell the country and keep the money himself, uh, but he can uh, make use of the country during the time that he is, that he is in charge. Now, does that make a difference? The answer is, it makes a tremendous difference. Imagine I give you a house and tell you you are the owner of the house. You can sell it, you can see what happens to the market value of the house if you do this to the house or that to the house. You can pass it on in the form of an inheritance. Then you will, by and large, tend to preserve the value of the property. On the other hand, I tell you, the same house, you don't own it, you cannot sell it, you cannot pass it on as a form of an inheritance to somebody else. But for four years, eight years, you can use it as you see and try to make as much money out of it as, as you can do. Now, what you will do is, of course, you will engage in capital consumption. That is, even if the house is afterwards a ruin, but you had four glorious years where you could make all sorts of income from using this house. So the difference between a king and the democratic caretakers, the kings by and large have a long run perspective and by and large tend to preserve the value of their property because it is regarded as their property. Democratic rulers try to rob the country as quick as possible because they know after four or eight years they might have no chance to do so anymore. Um, so now I come to what then is the solution to the problem of social order and the enforcement of social order? The states are disasters in this regard for reasons that I explained. The solution is what I call a private law society. What is a private law society? Um, a private law society um, is a society where every individual institution is subject to one and the same rules, the rules that I explained at the very beginning. Uh, there exists no public law that grants privileges to anyone, to any particular person, or to any specific functions that people perform. Um, no one is permitted to acquire property by any other means than through original appropriation, through production, or through voluntary exchange. Nobody has the right to expropriate anyone. No one has the right to tax anyone. No one can prevent anyone else to enter with his own resources any line of production of goods or services that he might want to enter. That is, there exist no monopolies of any kind. And specifically to the problem that we have at hand, um, 
in a private law society the production of security, that is of making sure that nobody breaks laws and that those people who do break laws are caught, punished and so forth. This is also done by freely financed individual firms, by pre freely financed police agencies, insurance agencies and arbitration and arbitration agencies. Um, now, it would be somewhat presumptuous to try to predict exactly what the outcome of this will be, but we can predict uh, certain fundamental structural features of such a society. Um, first off, uh, while in a complex society based on division of labor, uh, self-defense will only play a secondary role, and I'll explain that later why, um, it should be clear from the outset that in a private law society everyone's right to engage in self-defense is sacrosanct. That is, nobody disputes the right of people to engage in self-defense. Um, in distinct contrast to the present situation, that is, to the present status situation with which we are, of course, all familiar, uh, which renders people increasingly uh, unarmed and defenseless against aggressors in a private law society, no restrictions on private ownership of firearms and other weapons would exist. Everyone's elementary right to engage in self-defense uh, to protect his life and property against invaders would be holy, so to speak. Um, and we do know from the Wild West, which was not as wild as it is depicted in Wild West movies, um, that the right of people to bear arms is enormously powerful. In the Wild West, it did not occur very frequently, hardly ever, that anyone tried to rob a bank. Because if you tried to rob a bank, in almost all cases, you were dead before you walked out of the bank because all bank tellers were armed and their, the chance to get out of this almost, was almost non-existent. There exists an abundance of literature on this, uh, how safe societies are in which people are allowed to own guns. Uh, there's a, a book by uh, American economist John Lott uh, with the title uh, um, More Guns, Less Crime, and he gives ample uh, empirical illustration for, for this statement. Uh, the more guns are in private hands, the less crime there is. Switzerland, for instance, is a country that is heavily armed. All Swiss males have uh, semi-machine guns at home with ammunition, and the crime rate in Switzerland is lower than in almost any other country that I'm aware of. Um, no, but just as in today's complex society, we do not produce our own shoes or telephones um, or cars, but rely on division of labor, uh, in a private law society, by and large, when it comes to the pro production of security, we would also rely on specialized producers and by no means rely exclusively on self-defense. Um, most security services will, in a private so law society, then provided by specialized agencies competing for voluntarily paying clients by various police, arbitration, and insurance companies. Now, if you wanted to summarize in one word what the decisive difference and advantage of a competitive security industry would be uh, as compared to the present statist um, uh, way of uh, providing security, if we wanted to characterize in one word what the difference would be, then this one word would be contract. The state, with which we are all familiar, um, as the ultimate decision maker and judge operates, as you all know, in some sort of contractless legal vacuum. There exists no contract between the state and its citizens. 
it is not contractually fixed what is actually owned by whom uh, and what accordingly needs to be protected is also not fixed. Um, it is not fixed what service the state is to provide, what is to happen if we are dissatisfied with what the state does, um, and it is not fixed what the price is that we must pay for this alleged service that the state provides protecting our lives and our pro uh, property. Um, nor is it fixed what happens if we come to the conclusion, look, you guys didn't do what you said you would do. Uh, what now? Now imagine something like this. Imagine there would be a private agency that would offer protection services to you, and they would just say something like, like this. Um, I will not contractually guarantee you anything. I will not tell you what specific things I will regard as your to be protected property. Nor will I tell you what I oblige myself to do according, uh, if, according to your opinion, I do not fulfill my service. But in any case, I reserve the right to unilaterally determine the price that you must pay me for such undefined service. Now, any security provider would immediately disappear from the market if he made you this type of offer. But this is exactly the type of offer that states make to you. Um, each private, freely financed security producer must instead offer its, protective client, its prospective clients a contract. And these contracts must, in order to appear, appear acceptable to the clients, uh, contain clear descriptions as well of the property that they want to protect, that is, what they regard as yours. Um, they must have clearly defined mutual services and obligations. And each party to a contract for the duration and until the fulfillment of the contract um, would be bound by the terms agreed to in the contract. And any change in the contract would only be possible if both parties to the contract agree to it. In contrast, you realize the state also changes the rules of the game as it goes along. It passes laws that make something that was yesterday legal, tomorrow illegal, and vice versa. No such thing would, of course, be possible if you have a contractual relationship with anyone else. And specifically, in order to appear acceptable to security buyers, these contracts must contain provisions about what will be done in the case of a conflict or dispute between the protector and those people that are protected. Um, that is, we all know conflicts like this can arise. I have a dispute with the police that wants to is supposed to protect me, with the insurance agency that's supposed to insure me, with the arbitration agency that is supposed to arbitrate in conflicts. What do we do in such a case? Uh, obviously, a contract would only be appearing acceptable to potential clients if there's a provision what will happen in those cases. And in those cases, there's only one solution. The solution is the insurer, the protecting agency, and the protected, the allegedly protected people can only agree on something where they say, in that case, we go to some independent third party arbitration. Uh, this is something very different from the current situation where whenever we go to appeal a decision, the next appeal court is also part of the same organization. The emphasis is here, the third party must be independent, otherwise clients uh, and uh, 
offerers of protection would not be able to agree uh, agree on this. And these arbitrators, these independent arbitration uh, agencies, are characterized again by the fact that they are also freely financed organizations. Um, and if they don't do what insurers and insured expect of them, namely to come up with a solution that is considered to be a fair solution by all sides involved, they will not again be chosen as an independent third party in the future. That is, in this market of independent third parties, only those people will be able to survive who have, have the capability of coming up with solutions that are deemed mutually beneficial, all around beneficial, and somebody who is considered to be a biased, uh, a partial judge, a partial arbitrator, he will simply disappear from the market of, uh, of arbitrators. Um, now, from this fundamental advantage of a private law society, uh, a number of additional uh, advantages follow. The fundamental advantage is there is a contractual relationship instead of a non-contractual vacuum, as it is currently the case. First off, competition among police, insurers, arbitrators and so forth for paying clients would bring about a tendency toward a continuous fall in the price of protection per insured value, um, which would make protection, so to speak, increasingly more affordable, whereas under the current monopolistic uh, conditions, the price of protection continuously rises and the quality of protection continuously falls. In addition, as I already indicated, protection and security are goods and services that compete with all sorts of other goods and services. If more services are allocated to protection, then less resources are available for buying a house or a car or going on, going on vacation. Uh, or if I... Uh, uh, offer more protection for one group, uh, less protection can be offered for another group. Um, as a tax-funded monopolist providing protection, all these decisions, how to allocate resources to this purpose or that purpose, are completely arbitrary. Um, in distinct contrast, in a system of freely competing protection agencies, all arbitrariness of allocation all over or under production of security would disappear. Um, protection would be accorded the relative importance that it has in the eyes of different consumers. Some people want more money to be spent on it, some people want to spend less money on it. Uh, and each and every one would in a private law society receive protection in accordance with its own desires and its own willingness to pay for the specific services. Um, now, the most important advantage of a private contract-based production of law and order, however, is of a qualitative nature. Um, first, there is a fight against crime. The state is notoriously inefficient when it comes to fighting crime because the state agents entrusted with this task of protecting our life and property uh, are paid out of taxes. That is, they are paid independent of their productivity. Why should anyone work if one is also paid for doing nothing at all? Why should I run after criminals, so to speak, uh, if it is much nicer, for instance, to hand out parking tickets or to drink coffee at 7-Eleven stores. Um, in fact, it can be expected that the, the state's agents have even an interest in uh, keeping crime rates moderately high because this way they can always justify that they need bigger budget allocations than they, than they received in um, in the, previous, in the previous year. Um, and things are even worse. 
um, the state agents um, do not indemnify or compensate victims. They are supposed to protect us. But what if they fail? Do they then pay anything to those people that they were supposed to protect but didn't successfully protect? Um, that is, for state for the state victims of crime and the indemnif indemnification and compensation of victims play at best a very negligible role. Um, the state does not compensate, indemnify victims of crime. To the contrary, the harm victims are still further insulted by making them pay for the criminals that are arrested. It is the taxpayers then have to pay for the muesli and the TV and the table tennis entertainment that criminals that are housed in, uh, in criminal facilities um, uh, get. Uh, uh, instead of being compensated for the harm that was done to, that was done to them. Um, now, the situation in a private law society is obviously entirely different. Um, security providers, and in particular insurers, will have to indemnify their clients in the case of actual damage, otherwise they would simply find no clients, and because of this they must operate efficiently. They must be efficient in preventing crime, because if they are not efficient in preventing crime, then they have to pay. Uh, they must be efficient in finding goods that were stolen from you. Because if they don't find them, then they have to pay. They have to buy you a new TV. Um, states don't do anything like this. Um, I always give the example. Um, a friend that had his VW stolen in Italy. Uh, he went to the Italian police, said my car was stolen. Um, the police said, OK, we fill out a report. And uh, then he asked, what will, will now happen? And the police said, no, yeah, we filed this report. We put it in a little booklet, and that's it. And then he reported this case to his German insurance agency. And three days later, the German insurance agents found the car um, for an obvious reason. If they find the car, they don't need to pay for a new car. The state doesn't pay a new car. They file things. And of course, Private protection agencies would also have an incentive to find the perpetrators because then they can compel the perpetrators to pay compensation to the victims uh, instead of them having to pay all of, uh, all of the compensation. Um, in the other case, I explained that taxpayer, the victim must, as taxpayer, pay in addition for the incarceration of these people. In addition, a private, competitive, and contract-based security industry has a general peace-promoting effect. States are, as I have already in indicated, by nature aggressive institutions because they can cause and provoke conflicts and then decide the conflicts in their own favor. Or, to put it differently, a tax-funded monopolist of ultimate decision-making um, can externalize the cost of its own aggressive behavior onto hapless taxpayers. And because of that, they tend to engage in more risky and aggressive behavior than you would do if you would have to pay all the cost of engaging in aggressive behavior yourself. Um, moreover, Insurance companies are by nature, so to speak, defensive organizations. Um, on the one hand, because every act of aggress aggression is costly. And if you engage in aggressive activities, you must charge higher premiums to your, uh, to your own uh, clients. Uh, and that would involve that you lose clients to companies that behave in a non-aggressive way. Um, and insurance companies are 
peaceful in, uh, organizations for another reason as well. You cannot insure yourself against any type of risk. Uh, there are certain risks that are uninsurable. You can insure yourself against the risk of your house burning down. You can insure yourself against uh, death by accidents and so forth. But you cannot insure yourself against burning down your own house or killing myself tomorrow in a suicide, uh, in a suicide uh, attempt. Um, now, the implication of this is you can also not insure yourself against people uh, doing something about you, hitting you, if you yourself provoke the conflict. Uh, insurance companies will not cover this risk of being beaten by other people that you yourself first aggressed against or provoked into do is doing something bad to you. That is, insurance companies will only protect you and cover the risk uh, of certain risk if you yourself submit to a code of civilized behavior. If you just say, look, I will behave in a nice way, I will never provoke anyone and so forth, only then will they pro protect you, but not if you behave in uncivilized behavior. And this also involves that insurance companies will by and large insist that you do not engage in vigilante justice. That is, that you just take the law into your own hand because this involves the risk of third parties getting involved in the conflict. So they will by and large insist instead that whenever uh, conflicts arise, you have to submit yourself to, uh, to some regular procedures uh, of finding out what was the course of events, who initiated certain things, who responded in such and such a way. That is, vigilante justice will by and large be outlawed or made almost impossible by insurance companies insisting that in order to reduce our own uh, costs of operation, in order to make it possible that lower premiums will be offered to you, uh, you have to submit yourself to these types of uh, procedures. Uh, in addition, insurance companies will actually encourage people to own arms. Uh, you, realize, um, you realize that uh, states try to disarm us. Uh, imagine you go to some protection agency and the protection agency would tell you, look, before I start protecting you, first you have to hand over all weapons to me. Uh, the knives out of your kitchen drawers, your revolvers, whatever it is. Now, every normal person would say, this is a strange protector that insists, first of all, that I must hand over everything that I can use to defend myself, and only if I have handed over all of these things to them, to them only then will they possibly protect me. You would think, this is a fishy type of organization. Uh, Insurance companies who would do something like this would obviously go out of business instantly. Instead, they will offer you lower premiums um, if you can show that you know how to safely handle weapons to defend yourself because then the risk of something happening for which they have to pay is lower. They re you get reduced insurance rates, for instance, if you have a safe at home right now. Uh, in the same way, knowing how to use weapons would tend to reduce, uh, would tend to reduce uh, premiums. Last and most importantly, a system of competing protection agencies would have a twofold impact on the development of law. On the one hand, it would allow for a greater variability of law, that is, rather than imposing a uniform set of standards onto everyone, as under status conditions, protection agencies could compete against each other, not just via price, but also through product differentiation. There could exist side by side, for instance, Catholic protection agencies or insurers that would apply canon law. There could be Jewish agencies that apply Mosaic law, Muslim agencies that apply Islamic law, and agencies applying secular law 
or any variety of another. All of them sustained by a voluntarily paying clientele. Consumers could choose the law applied to them and their property. No one would have to live under foreign law. And on the other hand, the very same system of private law and order um, production would promote a tendency toward the unification and harmonization of law. Because the domestic law, that is the Catholic law, the Jewish law, the Roman law, and so forth, would apply, of course, only to people and property of those who had chosen it. Canon law, for instance, would apply only to professed Catholics and deal solely with intra-Catholic conflicts. Um, yet it is also possible, of course, that a Catholic might come into conflict with a subscriber of some other law, call, law code, for instance, a Muslim. If both law codes reach the same or a similar conclusion, no difficulties would arise. However, if competing law codes uh, arrived at distinctly different conclusions, as they would, at least in some cases, of course, um, then a problem arises. Now, the domestic law, um, that is, the intra-group law, would be useless in this case but naturally, every insured person would want protection against the contingency of intergroup conflicts also. In this situation, it cannot be expected that one insurer and the subscribers to its law code simply subordinate their judgment to that of another insurer and its law. Rather, for all the parties involved, there is again only one credible and acceptable way out of this predicament. And this is, from the outset, every insurer would be compelled to submit itself and its clients to arbitration by truly independent third parties. And this third party would not be only an independent entity, but at the same time, it would be the unanimous choice of both parties. It would be agreed upon because of its extremely or of its commonly perceived uh, ability to find mutually agreeable, fair solutions in cases of intergroup conflict. Moreover, if an arbitrator, as I explained before, failed in this task and arrived at conclusions that were perceived as unfair or biased by either one of the insurers or their clients, this person or agency would not likely be chosen as an arbitrator again in the future. And as a result of the constant cooperation of various insurers and arbitrators, a tendency toward the unification of property and contract law and the harmonization of the rules of procedure, um, evidence, and conflict resolution would be set in motion. In buying protection insurance, every insurer and insured becomes participated becomes a participant in some integrated system of conflict avoidance and peacekeeping. Every single conflict and damage claim, regardless of where and by and against whom, would fall always into the jurisdiction of one or a more specific insurance agency and would be handled either by an insurer's domestic insurer and domestic law or by the so-called international law provisions and procedures agreed upon by everyone in advance. So, in one word, instead of permanent conflict, injustice, and legal insecurity as under the present status conditions in a private law society, uh, peace, justice, and legal security would hold sway. Time is up and I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hope. Please be comfortable to stay here or just join me here to answer a short dialogue. Okay? Bom, nós vamos então ter um rápido diálogo com aproveitar essa oportunidade ímpar e eu começo perguntando para a plateia se alguém tem alguma pergunta. Na... Bom, teve ó, competência, rapidez. Vamos lá então. Uma pergunta, por favor, seja breve só por causa da questão do tempo. Eu peço que traga um microfone, já que o evento está sendo gravado e transmitido ao vivo também na internet. 
I should those nossos registros. Maybe, maybe I should mention that tomorrow my speech will be somewhat shorter than today. So certain, certain questions that might arise today, I will have more time uh, to, to answer tomorrow as, uh, to, tomorrow as well. I, I, some have thought that I would be the last speaker of the day and, and we wouldn't be under less time constraints than we actually are. Tomorrow I will be the last speaker of the day and my speech will be shorter, uh, I promise. Um, so um, just as a consolation in case I, I will not be able to answer all questions that might pop up now. E nós temos aqui o nosso presidente do Mises, que vai participar também com uma pergunta ao, ao professor Hope. Mas, por favor, então, a sua primeira pergunta. Sim, por favor. É, boa tarde. Gostaria de perguntar ao professor o que, que ele é, considera da, das opiniões do Robert Nozick, no livro Aqui Estado da Utopia, sobre essa questão das agências de proteção privadas. Porque o Nozick desenvolveu esse raciocínio, só que ele é crítico a ideia de ações de a agência de proteção privada, porque ele acredita que elas vão inevitavelmente entrar em conflito e isso acabaria levando a necessidade de, de que se crie um Estado ultra mínimo e, consequentemente, o um Estado mínimo. Queria que você desse sua opinião sobre a argumentação do Nose que conta essa questão das agências de proteção privadas. I consider his answer completely unsatisfactory. Why would, why would insurance companies necessarily come into conflict with each other? Uh, because if they come in conflict with each other, that increases the, the cost of operation of uh, these insurance companies and they would lose clients if they would engage in this type, uh, in this type of behavior. And in, in general, we know that there is, uh, uh, as in, in all other fields, there are fundamental reasons also why insurance companies would not engage in cartel in cartel agreements because cartels tend to fall apart uh, first because of in, internal pressure so to speak um, that is uh, that is the fact that um, the um, uh, in, in insurance in, in the um, uh, the most the most efficient the most efficient company would uh, lose out in any cartel agreement and the least efficient companies would benefit from any cartel agreement so why would uh, the most efficient uh, members of a cartel engage in such a behavior and secondly there is external pressure because uh, new firms can spring up and go into competition uh, should the cartel be able uh, to uh, reduce supply of services and uh, and raise the price. Uh, so again, I uh, I, f I find uh, Nozick's uh, objections entirely super superficial, fancy fanciful, uh, with no basis in economic theory whatsoever. Hello, okay. favor, se gostaria de fazer a pergunta. There's a question uh, from uh, one of the members of the Mises Brazil team. Uh, I'll say it first in English and then in Portuguese. Professor, according to your explanation, a monarchy tends to protect better the property of the people than a democracy. In that sense, how do you analyze the recent uh, revolutions in the Islamic countries that aim to overtake monarchies and institute democracies? Em português, professor, de acordo com a sua explicação, uma monarquia tende a proteger melhor a propriedade privada do que uma democracia. Nesse sentido, como o senhor analisa as recentes rebeliões nos países islâmicos que visam tirar monarquias e instituir democracias? I'm, I'm not a defender of monarchy, I'm not a monarchist. Um, monarquies are also states. Uh, states are rip-off organizations everywhere. But if you look at the current situation, it was interesting to see that, of course, the monarchies that were under attack uh, handled the attacks far more successfully than those states that were uh, dictatorial, uh, that is considered to themselves to be uh, public uh, public administrations, republican administrations. There is, Mar 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 the situation in Morocco and Jordania is significantly better than the situation was in Libya uh, and in Egypt. 
for instance, which indicates precisely what I said, that relatively speaking, and I should add, um, dictatorships are typically the outgrowth of democracy, democracy running into difficulties, and then the outcome of the difficulties that democracies run into is the erection of, uh, of dictatorships. Dictatorships uh, are a republican uh, phenomenon, not a monarchical phenomenon. Uh, Hitler was certainly more, um, more democratic, so to speak, than, uh, than the German Kaiser. Stalin was certainly more democratic uh, than the Russian Tsar. Um, the Russian Tsar was not a very nice person, but as compared to what came afterwards, uh, the, he was just a marvelously nice person. Uh, <laughs> Kaiser Wilhelm II was not the greatest person on earth, but as compared with Hitler, of course, he was a nice man. Um, so we, are, we have to compare things um, in, a balanced, in a balanced way, and again, the, the current situation seems to indicate that monarchies are, are by and large a better system than uh, democracies turned into dictatorships and so forth. Eu acredito que uma polêmica como essa merece uma pergunta bônus, então a gente abre para uma terceira pergunta. Alguém gostaria, aqui na plateia, por favor? É, o microfone, por favor, ali para... Só levanta para ficar mais, por favor, para ficar mais fácil. Isso. Aqui. Oi, desculpa. Bom, é, fica lá, fica à vontade. A gente vai deixar então para amanhã que vai ter mais um debate a sua participação. Daí, muito obrigada de qualquer forma. Por favor. Good afternoon. Maybe I should. Brazil had a monarchy also. Uh, again, I'm not. Uh, a great history buff as far as Brazil is concerned, uh, but my impression was that the, if Brazil had kept the monarchy, they might be in better shape today also than they are uh, given that they got rid of it. Good afternoon, Professor. I'm Marcel van Hattem. Um, I want to ask you about disarmament. We had a huge uh, discussion in Brazil uh, over disarmament, disarmament a few years ago, and uh, the, that, uh, uh, in the end, the population of Brazil, we said no again uh, against disarmament. Uh, but recently, two, year, two days ago, we had uh, here in Rio de Janeiro, I'm sure you're aware of, one of the saddest events ever in Brazilian history on a terrorist attack in a school. And, uh, well, the deaths were yet to be counted, and the activists pro disarmament were already uh, stating and tweeting that disarmament of the civil population of Brazil was necessary and if they were disarmed, or, I mean, if we were disarmed, unarmed, we wouldn't, we, uh, this kind of attacks wouldn't be possible in this school. So I think every one of us here has to be competent enough to defend these ideas, I mean, uh, or, or to, to give arguments against these ideas of disarmament. What would you say about this in this very... Uh, situation now we're facing here in Brazil because I'm sure uh, we, when we get outside here, we will face uh, another huge discussion in Brazil about uh, unarming uh, people. Thank you. Again, I, I've heard about the incident. I'm not familiar with the details of it. It might well be, as it was in many cases in the United States, that these attacks occurred, of course, uh, against targets where the people themselves were not armed. Um, exactly. So yeah. this is this is probably I assume that is probably the case in Brazil also that if these people who had been shot down would have been armed, uh, then this crazy guy would have been uh, killed faster, sooner, uh, and the whole catastrophe would have been less than it actually uh, turned out to be. Uh, in the United States, in in most of these cases, it, it involved. Uh, places where people were not allowed to be armed and then somebody with arms coming in killing of all sorts of people if the schools the universities and so forth where these attacks had taken place if the employees in these places would have had weapons would, well, especially concealed weapons uh, the attackers might have been eliminated much faster 
than it occurred if you have to wait for the police to come. And people who want to get weapons, criminals always get weapons. Uh, that is, we, we, when we outlaw these things, we outlaw law-abiding citizens, so to speak, to have weapons. We cannot, we cannot pass a law that says, look, you criminals, you can no longer have any weapons, and then the criminals will say, oh, yeah, right. Uh, uh, I want to be a law-abiding citizen, and I do no longer want to be a criminal, and because of that, I also will no longer have any weapons.